but thank you for taking the uh, time to join me. Um, and we're going to look at sort of the washroom facilities and how you can maybe make the most of them within your building. So, can I, there we go. So, who are we? Who is Bruner Options? So, my mum founded the company in 2006. We are family owned and operated. I like to say that she's on flexi retirement now, um, but she still has a firm hold on what's going on. Um, we're based within the Midlands, uh, but we specialise in eco-friendly washroom services and clinical waste management. We pride ourselves on tailoring our services to our clients' needs um, and offering things like recycled dispensers, sugarcane-based toilet paper, um, all with trying to give really good customer service. So it's our two little uh, office dogs, Missy and Titch, who are in a lot. Um, the way in which we frame the majority of what we do is around our core values. So it's always give a daisy. So it's act with compassion, uh, generate excellence and innovation. So really giving your best by pushing the boundary of what's possible. Um, amplify trust and empower. So we are um, a female strong team. We do have um, male service drivers as well. However, um, we are a really strong, I like to say a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> um, and we have a really big thing about delivering happiness for our employees and all of what we do and having that family balance and making sure that everything if it's a sports day, if it's um, a nativity, anything that's to do with family or children, that it is a necessity that you have to go. It's not, can I have it? It's you're going. So how did I get into washroom? Um, and how did I cut my teeth in the industry? So when mum started the company in 2006, uh, I was still at school. I started doing the filing for my pocket money. <laughs> um, some might say I'm following in the footsteps of mom, but I like to joke that I was pushed. <laughs> um, in 2009, when I was at college and I'd passed my test and things, I was then given my own routes, uh, service routes to do. And again, the, the joke was, well, if you don't do your runs, you're not gonna get money put on your card so you can have lunch. When I then left university, um, my mum had a really good idea about bringing a product into the tattoo industry, which revolutionised the dirty water. So when you have a tattoo, there is a little cup of water that's on the side, um, which then contains uh, water, blood and ink. That then is uh, transported by hand to the dirty sink and poured down. Or one of our customers said, well, could we not solidify that um, so that we're not, so we, you sort of ha haven't got that trip hazard. Um, so that's what we did. We brought it to market and I spent many a weekend um, at tattoo conventions um, with some of the best tattoo artists within the world. Um, and I sort of got a lot more of my people skills um, and the waste, which obviously tattooists uh, bring. So if anyone asked me when you're at school, because at 16, you're meant to know what, what you want to do. Um, what I don't think I would have said an office manager, and I don't think I would have said running a washroom and waste management company. But what I did know is that I really loved the operations of a business. Um, from an early age, I used to attend events and shows with my dad in the automotive industry where I learned to do the till, take credit card payments on one of those old fashioned machines, um, along with balancing the books at the end of the day. Um, and I did actually Google what those credit card machines uh, were called. Uh, and good old Wikipedia said it was a zip zap machine, um, a click and clack machine or a knuckle buster. So you can imagine my little hands trying to do them. It was... Um, it, it was quite funny. 
So I don't think people necessarily realise or appreciate that being an office manager, how many hats that you do uh, wear. So a support ecosystem such as the office management portal, it's really fantastic to hone in that those skills and have a network to collaborate with, bounce ideas, and I'm sure have many a moment of, oh, such and such happened, and then a colleague saying, ah, well, when that happened to me, I did this. So in 2016, that's when I was our office manager. Um, and then in 2020, we have we've now we we hired our now office manager, uh, Dina, and we expanded uh, and we started our digital transformation journey. So looking at going over to tablet rather than paper. Um, we all know what technology brings. So from sort of 2022 to now, um, I look after the overall um, of greener options, the day to day. Um, but I've got a really, really good, strong senior management team, um, which are always there helping. And what, one of the things that I always li like to say is to always surround yourself with people who are better than you, because everyone that's on our team is far better than me with what they do. So diving straight in to the legal requirements and employee wellbeing. So what should I be providing? I think this is one of the questions which we get asked a lot. Well, what, what, should, it, what should I be? So in the UK, through uh, the Workplace Health and Safety Regulations of 1992 state that the employer are required to provide clean and safe washrooms for their employees. But what does that mean? It's things like toilet paper, hot water, soap, hand drying facilities and sanitary disposal. So obviously all of these things are maybe what we may might think is basic um but it's really important that the businesses meet these regulations to avoid penalties to ensure the comfort and the safety of their staff so who can take your sanitary waste i think again is another question which we've been asked a lot um only licensed waste carriers with the environmental agency can legally collect and transport waste from businesses ensuring that you're compliant with the environmental regulations but again what what does that mean so first is your legal obligation so sanitary waste is classified as offensive waste and workplaces are required to manage it properly so simply disposing of it in regular black bins could lead to fines and penalties under those regulations We've got health and hygiene concerns. Um, so offensive waste can pose a risk of infection and disease if it's not handled properly. It needs to be stored, transported and disposed of in a safe manner by a licensed carrier who knows how to manage these risks. And although Group Greener Options, we do take one step above and all of our drivers are ADR trained, which means they can carry dangerous goods everyone still has um, the same the same training for sanitary bins and for everything that we do within the washroom. Also, it's a duty of care. So businesses have a legal duty of care to ensure that their waste is managed safely and legally. So using a licensed waste carrier ensures that the waste is disposed of at a permitted facility, reducing the environmental and the public risk. So when we take waste away um, as a carrier, we have to provide you with a waste transfer document. So with that, it's really important for your auditing and compliance. What that document basically is, is us saying that we have collected um, yay waste from X site and we're taking it to Y um, so that you know that it's been transported correctly, that we're legally entitled to take it. So those documents are kept for, so waste transfer notes are for two years. So it's two years plus the existing year. 
um, for your documentation. The other thing for avoiding pollution, so sanitary waste in black bins could potentially lead to uh, improper disposal in landfill, which may not have the correct treatment uh, facility for this kind of waste. So by using a licensed waste carrier, you're um, ensuring that it's handled legally, hygienically, and in, in, in an environmentally responsible way. So the shift in employee expectation. This has been a really big one for us, um, and we've noticed it over, I think, predominantly since COVID. However, we have always tried to suggest these types of services um, for quite a, a long time, but I think more, more people now are recognising them. It is evolving beyond the basics. So as employee well-being does now take centre stage in modern workplaces, washrooms being expected to do more than just meet those basic needs. It isn't just about hygiene. It's about making sure that your employees feel taken care of, they feel respected, and you're showing them that their health and their well-being is a priority to you. So inclusive facilities. So employees want washrooms that support their health and reflect the diverse needs within any workforce. Uh, this includes providing sanitary bins, perhaps in men's washrooms so they can address issues like prostate health, or it might be offering free vend uh, in both for things like sanitary towels, your tampons in both male and uh, female and gender neutral toilets to support that menstrual health. So small changes can make um, a difference within your workplace because it gives that it fosters a sense of belonging, um, and in turn that could lead to a higher staff retention because employees will be more likely to want to stay because. They feel that their needs have been prior prioritised and they are valued. Another increase which we've seen is uh, sharp spins uh, in workplace. So these are for sometimes people that are diabetic or they might be taking um, an injection for a certain period of time. So that too can ensure that their health um, and their needs are respective. So inclusion can, can be shown in many ways. So perhaps have a little chat with your team, see what, if anything, you could change within your washroom to see how that may make a difference. Sometimes you can't always see how something would make a difference, but if we can look at it from an overall perspective, um, and listen to everyone's thoughts and views, then I think it can only help for going forward. So lifting the lid on incontinence. So there has been a really big campaign called The Boys Need Bins, um, and it's worked really hard to raise the awareness about male incontinence and the need for bins in, me in men's toilets. The charity has been campaigning with a number of national um, organisations as well as the all-party parliament group for bladder and bowel continence care to give the government, to get the government um, to make it law to have sanitary bins in men's toilets also. So some of the um, supporters are things like men's health, um, trucker toilets, um, all places that you might not necessarily think, but we are being asked for it a lot more now, looking at that inclusion. So a couple of facts, one in 25 men aged over 50 will experience some form of uh, urinary leakage every year. These things are all um, 
perhaps maybe taboo, not taboo subjects, but um, sort of not not spoken about subjects. Um, but what the Boys Need Bins campaign is trying to do is to bring that to the table to show everyone that it is important and it is needed. Um, and the second one there, so one in 20 men aged 16 overall experienced bowel incontinence in the UK. So there was a report done in 2023, which um, highlighted four key areas. Um, so the report was a total of 84 men in 62 workplaces uh, completed the survey between March and May last year. So the first one, I think, is quite staggering. It's 95% of men indicated feeling stressed and anxious with this lead to worry about smelling or leaking and the mental health impact for men who are incontinent shouldn't be unestimated. And 42% said that they feel embarrassed, stressed and anxious about using a disabled toilet, stating just that they're not disabled. So why, why would they need to? So the second point is 87% reported having to wear a pad for longer than they'd like to, as they weren't able to dispose of it when they needed to. Which I think, from a lady's point of view, when you've been to places and, you know, you might be on your period and therefore you might have to then wrap them up and take, take them home. And it's a really horrible thing to think of, but I suppose we don't necessarily um, think about it as much in a female toilet but I can equally uh, empathize with how that would make you feel. So the public health impact, so the, there is further public health concern arise where men have to carry sanitary waste home with them due to that lack of facility um, and that could leak um, or smell, it, 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 it's just something else which isn't, it's not pleasant. And what do they want to see happen to resolve this issue? Um, they think that the solution is simple, that 98% of the respondents agreed that male sanitary bins should be made available in public uh, men's public washrooms. So within the washroom as a whole i've seen a huge influx in technology within the washroom and i think certainly over the past sort of four years or so um, it's become more prevalent um, and various things i think if we look back as to two or three years now our phones are not out of date but you know there's much much more advanced technology that's coming through so the first thing is app controlled devices with real time data. So that's things like your sanitary bins, that's air fresheners, toilet roll, um, paper towel, anything. Um, there, there are companies now out there that are providing that real time data where it's an app on your phone. You can look at the levels. You can either... Um, as you can see on the diagram, the the data from those devices either come to your smartphone or go into a gateway which links into your Wi-Fi, uh, which you can then view either on your phone or sat at a computer. So sort of fairly large buildings that going into each cubicle or each floor to see is there enough toilet roll, has the air freshener it, ran out, uh, what about the blue towel or the blue roll or the hand soap? From a time-saving perspective, it's it's making um, a huge, huge difference. Obviously, we've always seen things like touchless soap uh, dispensers or hand dryers or sensor-based taps um, or things like uh, water management systems to reduce the water consumption. Um, these innovations not only improve hygiene, but they also can save the cost on the other end. So I think really the industry is 
innovating and we are moving forward. Another thing, who carries cash now? <laughs> um, so with the contactless vending, so these could are your multi-vends. And what we are seeing is that they are higher value items within um, the vend machine because it's far more secure than popping a pound or two pounds in. Um, some of the items could be 10, 12 pounds um, on a whole host of products. Uh, that you could have in there. So this is quite an exciting um, one, which we've recently um, started stocking and implementing within our customers. So historically, we've had aerosol air fresheners, which A, you've got a can, B, it's pressure, the can is pressurized, um, and then you then have um, a pressurized can which you then need to get rid of. Um, a lot of people are now coming away from aerosols. The scent which is given over that time period, you tend to have peaks and troughs. So it smells really nice sort of just after it's um, dispensed, but then you sort of 15, 20 minutes later, that smells died down. So oxygen technology, um, it has been around for a little while. Um, the idea is you've got your dispenser, you, you have the batteries which supply the power to the generator, um, and it's patented gas cell technology which releases a precise uh, dosage of oxygen. And that oxygen is pumped into a sealed chamber um, and it displaces the fragrance from the cartridge below, which delivers a really precise dose of that fragrance onto a pad. Um, and those molecules are then dispersed by the natural air movement within the area or room. So when an air freshener goes off, if it's an aerosol, you don't get that, are you stood under it? Are you going to be showered with lemon sherbet? <laughs> Um, it's more of a consistent fragrance rather than having those peaks and troughs. We've um, had really good reviews from them and you can get various um, covers for them. You can have a very basic one or um, then have them where they look a little bit sleeker, either in white or black. So I'm not sure if any of you know, but there is an association for washroom services, um, which is called the IWSA. Um, we are um, a member of the IWSA as long as one of our um, other partners, uh, Lisa at Pristine, which I'm sure you may know. Um, and basically what that is, is it gives you local expertise, but with national coverage. So there's around 40 members of the IWSA and you have to go through a vetting process before you go in and you have to um, agree to provide the same level of service. So that's things like timely um, getting back to people and also if, there's, if you have a national company um, which that, that they might have a couple of offices in Birmingham, a couple in London, maybe one in Belfast, one in Edinburgh, that you can still deal with a person, with one person, um, but then they may ask the sites perhaps in Belfast or Edinburgh that maybe they don't go to, that an IWSA member can do that on their behalf. So we do benefit from that local personalised service while being part of that larger network across the UK and Ireland. So it gives you the that best of both worlds. Um, it's a familiar, reliable point of contact, but combined with that national support and that national coverage. So unlike perhaps larger organisations um, with really rigid packages that you have to have this collected on X frequency, you generally tend to see it with the collection of whether it be medical waste or nappy waste, that they may charge you a set amount or whether you present one bags or three bags to be collected. Um, 
within the RWSA, the we do ha- have have um, again the same ethos really that we provide tailored solutions that meet the specific needs for your business, um, from eco-friendly solutions to specialised services um, such as free vans um, or sharp spins. The independent provider are more adaptable. Um, and nine times out of 10, the people that are within the IWSA, it is about the customer. So if there is an issue, then they are more than likely, as I do, um, sometimes you jump in a van and you go and do it yourself to make sure that you sort that customer out. So you, you do have a different level of service to um, a larger organization. So sustainability and compliance, all of the IWSA members do have a focus on eco-friendly products and practices, ensuring compliance, health and safety, and those environmental regulations. So this commitment doesn't only reduce your environmental footprint, but it can also demonstrate the company's dedication to sustainability. Um, One of the things which I know we have in a lot of companies within the IWSA, they will have their their equivalent. We have um, a technical and compliance manager who, if needed, he is licensed to run a waste transfer station. So for our customers, if anyone has a problem about, well, where do I put this? Or how do I package that? Or does this need to be handled differently? We have that person that's on call um, to assist with those types of issues to help the customer. So another point, so really we are all, we're all independent washroom service providers, but we can often deliver cost-effective services without having to compromise on that quality. And being flexible means we can offer you solutions that meet your budget um, while still maintaining a really, really good level of service. And I suppose a really important one is that anyone that's within the IWSA, we are licensed and we're professional. um, And we ensure that your business meets all the legal and safety requirements while still maintaining that level of service so you can have that national coverage but that personalized tailored surface so just to recap legal requirements so make sure that you've got the basics covered and make sure that you've got a licensed waste carrier for collecting your waste. Employee wellbeing. So be an inclusive workplace, find out what you could do just to make life just that little bit easier. Um, As I said before, it's not just about what you think is the right thing. Ask who you've got in your team, Um, find out what would help them from from their point of view i always think everyone else's um input is really really invaluable technology in the washroom it is it is there um it is coming and i think over the next two to three years we will see far more of it for the real-time data for monitoring for cost management so that if you have got budgets that you've got that handle and you don't know sort of where the the toilet paper is going from the second floor in the gents um because you put it as as quick as you, you can put it in it's going and why choose an IWSA member so again it's just that personalized flexible service which is backed by a network of independent providers across the UK and Ireland. So has anyone got any questions?
Thanks so much, Holly. I, I had one earlier on. You mentioned about the um, waste note. You need to keep it for two years plus the existing year. So if, for example, waste had been collected this Friday, would that mean you've got to keep it until at least the summer of 2026? Or is it 2027 technically? Because it's So this we're in 2024 now. So anything that you have in 24 um, and then you then go back to. So you'd have to keep 23 and 22. So it's two plus your existing year. So if you treated it as three, yeah that would okay suffice. I see yeah so keep your previous two years plus existing I think okay cool thank you are there any questions from anyone else there I wanted to ask about the um the medical bins um because yeah. we have quite a few employees that inject themselves at work and it's a yeah. real struggle to get um it collected and get a new bin and things like that um so with your company is that something you provide or is it just something you you speak about that it should be something we have um no so that that's our bread and butter so our drivers are out on the road every day collecting waste uh sharps bins pharmaceutical bins um and then also providing um washroom services so things like your sanitary bins medical bins nappy bins um from all different um companies so with your sharp spins that you've got at the moment, are they, have you got them in a, in a proper sharp spin or? Yeah, but the, it tends to be the, the guys, the old, they'll bring one from home and share it and then take it back to get it collected. Cause it's been a real struggle for them to come into our office to collect it. They tend to just want to go to houses, people's homes. Okay. So, Mm -hmm. so, so we we predominantly collect um from businesses but we we also are so various councils you do have um within your council tax you have the provision of clinical waste so we're the clinical arm for various councils where we do do door collections as part of that council but for what you're saying charlotte i think um you know depending on what area you are I think if we can touch base and I can point you in the right direction if we're not in that area. Um, but I think one of the huge um, issues on slightly larger companies is that they want to set you into a, we're collecting one sharp spin every six months or one sharp spin, you know, on a, on a set basis so that they're charging you on a set basis. Um, I, like many of the um, IWSA members, we we don't um we, we don't work like that if you need to have uh just a collection once a year or what once every two years that's absolutely fine we're we're happy um and a lot of the iwsa members are happy to to fit in with you because we're here to help we're not here to make things difficult or to hinder okay brilliant uh, there's a question in the chat. If our waste is collated by our cleaners and left outside for council collection, should they be providing us a waste transfer note for the safe disposal of sanitary waste or would we need to obtain one from the council? OK, so Natalie, this is a, re this is a really, a really, um, a really good one because it happens a lot. So your waste is your waste until someone else touches it. If someone else touches it, then it, it is then in their hands. So they would need to be um, a, a licensed carrier or broker for that. So technically, your cleaner would need to be a carrier and they should be disposing of the waste. If you're leaving it out for the council... Um, are they putting that in black bagged waste? Are they putting it out as um, yellow tiger bags? Um, for example, to, um, what what we do with some of our schools, because we all know that budgets are really tight. So we either rent them the bin, the sanitary bins, um, or some, some of our schools buy them. Um, and then their cleaners go around and, and clean them and empty them, but they then put them into a much larger yellow 
with a tiger stripe down sack. And then that then goes outside for us to collect um, or a licensed waste carrier to collect. So I suppose it depends how they're presenting that waste to the council. Do you know how they they are presenting it? No, I don't, I'm afraid. Um, it's only when you mentioned that transfer note that it even ever occurred to me, to be honest, how they dispose of it. I've never seen a transfer note from them ever. So now I'm wondering whether they just do a little sneaky and put it in the rest of the waste with all our other rubbish. Yeah, it's not uncommon, Natalie. Um, it's not, I wouldn't say it's the done thing. Um, because obviously you do need to have it taken away by a licensed waste carrier. Um, however, it does happen, but I suppose one of our, our jobs um, as office manager is looking at that trail back and making sure that you've got that documentation. What I would probably start doing is asking the questions and watch if they squirm. Yeah, absolutely. I'll be getting onto that this afternoon, I think. Thank you. No, no problem. What what they can do, Natalie, sometimes is provide you. So just to go over, so a waste transfer note or a WTN um, is also the same as a duty of care certificate. They're the same thing. Um, so with a duty of care, you can be given one for the year whereas a waste transfer note can be just for each collection. Okay, that's great. I'm making a note of that as we speak. Thank you. It's all right. No problem at all. Fab. Are there any other questions from anybody? Yeah, I've got one, Hannah. Huh? Um, Holly, so I went on a recent first aid course and they were speaking about waste and obviously not being able to put um, contaminated bandages um, and the such like in the general waste bin. Um, I mean, I went right down to the point of what do we do with plasters, for example, then if we're in the office. Um, obviously, first aid issues, very rare. But do you have any advice in terms of how people manage that kind of waste in the building that's quite infrequent? Yeah, so first aid waste, obviously in larger organisations, they may have a first aid bin in their medical room. Um, but in sort of smaller buildings or where your floors and like you're saying, it's very infrequent, you might get, I don't know, a paper cut and those things don't stop bleeding. <laughs> um, so you go and get a plaster. Um, my advice would be that if it is so infrequent, um, then a plaster in the bin is not, it, you know, I think what comes is this non-hazardous and hazardous um, divide. So the, 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 the classification is if you are going to cause um, harm or a real harm to the environment, other people, animals, the air or water, um, then that way should be classed as hazardous. However, there is a, a thought process within the waste industry that if you, you know, if you know that, because really blood, it's about any bloodborne diseases. So usually if you've got a bloodborne disease, you know. Therefore, if as long as you know that they haven't, then I would, I would just, if it's so infrequent, I would just pop it in the normal bin. Thanks. And in terms of um, more widely, so do you deal with bins for first aid waste? Is there something in particular, like similar to a sharps bin? Is there something similar like that for first aid waste? Yeah, so it's a little bit like if you go to um, well, any sort of public toilet or garden centre or that sort of thing, you, you have um, like, like a nappy bin, which... The waste goes in, but if you were to lift the lid uh, or press the pedal for the lid to lift, that you wouldn't be able to get your hand in. It's got that catch. Um, so in a lot of instances, because it is sort of so few and far between, what we do for uh, some of our schools is we do a collection at the end of each term so that they have, um, you know, a fresh bin for then the new term or 
depending on how quickly that gets built up. Um, but they do sort of generally stand at your normal kitchen size bin. OK, great. Thank you. Super. I think that might be everything, but has anyone else got any other questions at all? No? See, I told you, Holly, when Holly and I first spoke, <laughs> you know what I'm going to say, don't you? She was like, surely I can't do a webinar on this kind of thing when we first talked about partnership. And I said, I promise you there's going to be a lot of questions on this subject, even though it's washrooms and waste. You're like, surely it's not that interesting. We have questions on everything in these roles. So thank you so much for, for being on with us and um, yeah, sharing lots of insights there and answering lots of questions for them. I'm sure it was useful. If there are any other questions, Holly is one of the partners on the portal guide, so you can reach out there. And this will be recorded as well and popped into the portal so you can always watch it back if you need to. Brilliant. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your time and, and your patience. Thank, Thank you. you. See you soon. Thanks. Yes, bye. Bye.